every two or three years they'll get a they'll get a, a storm in there, and every about seven years they'll get a hurricane that comes through there, and uh, it's quite an experience to go. Have you ever been through no. a natural disaster or something like that? <laughs> Did you feel yes. the you? Did you feel the earthquake the, the other day? We were oh, in the yeah, middle we of were a on scene stage. on stage. When How do you feel? Coming. All right, so you're on stage. You're I there at the Las Palmas Theater. There's all these lights hanging up there. I kept looking up yeah. and hanging on to the side of the stage while it shook. And what somebody was going, earthquake, earthquake. I couldn't remember who We were doing a scene was. where I was waiting on one side of all the All right, let me, let, me, let me continue. This is Stephanie Zimblis and Gregory Harrison. And they're in the uh, musical festival that's playing in the Las Palmas Theater. And that's what we're beginning to talk about right now. Go ahead. We were, we were rehearsing a pirate number, and the fellow who plays the, the young man opposite me was on one side of the proscenium off stage, and I was on the other. And we're waiting to enter, and Billy was practicing an, another dance <laughs> in, another sh in another part of the show while before he went on, and he's jumping around. All of a sudden, the whole room starts to shake, and I thought, Billy. <laughs> <laughs> he's off. I know. He's a little more light footed than that. <laughs> And, and the fellow, and there was another fellow on the top of the set who was adjusting something, and he looked down at Billy and thought, "My goodness, what's going on?" And then about ten seconds later, we all realized it was an earthquake. Mm -hmm. But it didn't really rattle us that much. It was yeah. just very brief. Apparently, the the head of it, the main part was in Malibu around somewhere. Senator, yeah, I came home after rehearsal that night, um, and in my apartment, uh, all my salt and pepper shakers and Mm -hmm. All the spices were off the cabinet, and uh, a few things, a few glasses had fallen. So it had shaken. I was glad I was on stage in Hollywood <laughs> instead of in my apartment in Hollywood. Yeah, no kidding. I had a, you know, I'm real interested in y'all as performers, and that was one of the things that I talked about when I talked to Larry Goldman uh, uh, about having y'all on the program. The main thing I wanted to talk about was performing and how it is uh, that because you're both at the very early stages in your career as far as as far as as what's happening and I kind of want to know from both of you what's going on in your minds as to as to all the things that are going around the interviews are beginning the the uh, the the work that's happening what's uh, what's going on in your heads right now Stephanie what well do you, what do you make all this that's happening <clears throat> to you right now I think for me, everything I've done, it really doesn't matter how <clears throat> how well everything is going. I still will have doubts, you know. So, it, it, for instance, I'll be doing something that another person might envy, mm -hmm. and yet, from my point of view, I I say to myself, not only why can't I be doing this, but um, I'm missing the main point. In for instance, if I'm if I'm doing a show, I'll. I'll be wrapped up in like a movie of the week, and, and whereas a friend of mine would be jealous that I even have the opportunity to be in it, I will be thinking of the problems of the character and how I'm not fulfilling them and how mm -hmm. I get frustrated. It, it, if, you know, in order to exist in a, in, a, in a space, there has to be a kind of something to keep driving you forward. And if, yeah. you're, if you're just sitting there satisfied, you just... So not that I don't enjoy it, but it's... Yeah, but the rewards are not necessarily the rewards that you would first think of when you're talking about an acting career. You know, the the acclaim, the uh, money, the uh, the recognition, the ego. You know, the, the basic ego factors that you would think of if you've never performed or you haven't performed. The rewards, I understand, come from a different place or are coming from a different place. Question? Well, ho hopefully they do. The ball. I think. Balls. I think the. Uh the, the the reason that I think a lot of people get into get involved in acting in the first place is because of the the uh, the ego uh, satisfaction that you foresee, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of the of the, the glamour and the recognition and the money. Some of us. No, I think. But I'm saying the reason that a lot of people get into it. Is is often for that reason. When you're 14 years old, that's pretty. What important else? Yeah. Stuff. Where else? That's your your. Mental you know, when you're looking forward and trying to decide what kind of career you're going to make, that's very that's very important uh, business. Uh, satisfying your ego and having a life filled with glamour, or what you think at least will be glamour. And that was, I have to admit, a, a great draw for me to come to Hollywood in the first place, and and start working on on trying to build an acting career. But you find, at least I found. Uh, in the next year or so after I first arrived here and started studying and, and 
I didn't work for about four or five years, just studied, so I had a long time to think about it. Uh, that I found that I fell in love with the art. Mm -hmm. and, and I realized from meeting people who were getting some of the, the glory and, and the money, that it really wasn't making anybody happy. That wasn't what was making anyone happy in this business. That the happiness was stemming from aesthetic uh, uh, satisfaction. And you from find being a, a credible artist among your peers, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. So it really had very little to do with any glamour or any money or any of that. And it's, I'm finding more and more that that is staying true. All right. Do you find a lot of happiness in this business? Uh, the thing that, that excited me about coming out here is to be able to meet all the performers that I had uh, seen and performed and fallen in love with the performances and the characters that they mm -hmm. did. And then to find that in some cases that while a person could play a full range, delightful person in a performance, but yet be, when as a human being, have so little uh, ability to deal with things or to deal with themselves as a human being and deal uh, I'm rattling now, but no, I'm trying no, no. to say I'm 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 trying that, to understand that the image something. they project on camera is not is, is often not at all what they are in it, real life. It both is yes, and and also that they're not uh, that this sensitive performance does not help them as a human being, or does not help them deal with things as a human being, and and this this kind of blew me away. I remember saying to Greg when we were doing Centennial, and he had like three or four months as Levi Zent. Yeah. And the, in the book and in the, in, I, I think, in the, in the writing of the, the screen, at, or the television adaptation, he's a very noble character, Levi. And mm -hmm. he has definite growth from point A through B through C and over the years. And I remember saying to you, remember, I, 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 I played Ellie, his first wife, and I, I get chucked off by a snake. My best wife. But, uh, Your best wife. My right. best wife. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I said to him, after play, you know, after you will have played this character for months on end, every day except Sunday, you know, and, and thinking the thoughts of the character, for, uh -huh. you can't help but be elevated a certain extent after playing this character. Mm -hmm. I, I, did you yeah, feel that? Did you feel, did you feel yeah. uh, for, for five months, actually, I, in total, I, I played Levi. Uh, and he was a man filled with integrity. More than anything else he possessed, it was integrity. And of course, I found myself starting to be more aggressive about my beliefs and uh, mm -hmm. uh, less afraid. Not that I'm very afraid to state what I feel to people, but, I, but le even less afraid. And even pr more, felt more pride in, in, in what I like about myself, et cetera, et cetera. And all these things started to, to build in me as I, as I got more and more involved in the character. And then the next part that we that I did, I came back off of Centennial and we did a, another television movie for Ross Hunter and I played a total schmuck and... Uh, no, it wasn't total schmuck. Well, let's say 90%, <laughs> 90%, right? Hmm. Yeah, it shows his 10% in the end, but... Uh, and I get to abuse her finally after a couple times of being very mm -hmm. adoring. And, uh, and I found myself going to visit friends after I'd get off work playing this, this heavy. And, and uh, they'd say, what's the matter with you, Greg? What are you doing? And Because I'd be talking and saying, yeah. So anyway, you know, it was a good day, you know what I mean? And uh, really... You can't use the words, hey, we would swear a lot. Yeah, I would swear <laughs> a lot, get real... But I, that was the kind of guy I was playing. Sure. And I, I, I didn't know. I mean, I really wasn't tuned into that until mm. the second part when I realized I was getting involved in these characters so far. I was reading a book um, last night which talked about the fact that you can you can uh, take life either as a victim or a, you, a reactor or an act yeah. or a person of action, and most of the parts that I've gotten in television, I hate to talk about myself, but it's just a point. Please talk. Um, are, are are victim parts? They're they're, they're girls that basically the, it's not an action that they have taken which provides the storyline, but it's something which happens to them. Mm -hmm. Either they're deaf or they're blind or a train has hit them <laughs> or, or they're bit by a rattlesnake or this or they're, they're take drugs or whatever. <clears throat> and I was thinking that well, probably the reason that I do this to some satisfactory performance is because uh, I, I probably am that way in life, mm -hmm. you know, I, I was I'm a ask reactor. You about that. Yeah, I, I, 
I'm, I'm passive and I allow myself to be a reactor and, and somewhat of a victim for some reason. I, not really, but on the, on the surface, I guess, uh, you know. So I, I think that who you are definitely in, in, in film and television, and I'm sure the stage, mm -hmm. because it just amplifies it. It only projects onto... Yeah, I mean, I know, you, I know you see that, but, but, and I'll ask you, do you see in her, have you seen through working with Stephanie a growth or, or, or things emerging from her that over, over the times, Gregory? Oh, sure. What? We Tom first worked Tom together. We first worked together on, on, mm -hmm. on the gathering two mm -hmm. years ago, and years and ago. she was you were what nineteen then twenty twenty I think. And uh, I I I had no idea who she was. I got on the plane to fly out to Ohio with her, and we talked. And I was going, boy, this girl's really protected. You know, she really mm -hmm. has a lot to learn. She's going to have to open herself and up. And I thought, and boy. she might thought, what a jerk! <laughs> <laughs> what a jerk this guy. Is. But, yeah. and then we worked together on that, played husband and wife, and, and I found her, I found her very charming and very... I was very industrious. I industrious, that's a real good word. <coughs> really concentrated on work and mm -hmm. uh, very little time for... Get very serious young woman. Very serious, very intense. Mm -hmm. uh, gonna do the job, gonna do it right. Oh no, I'm sorry, I can't get together afterwards uh, with the rest of you to sing Well, songs. the part... These people would party till all hours in the night and we'd have to do uh, work <laughs> at 7 o'clock in the morning, so I would say no, thank you. <laughs> was Gregory a strong, or, I mean, I'm feeling a great strength of personality through Gregory. The Gregory's a very strong personality, dominates a, a, a situation when he's in it. Mm -hmm. Was he like that then? I don't think as much. I don't think as much. <laughs> because, well, first of all, we both had minor parts in this first yeah. thing we were in, so we didn't have the, the, the uh, he was charming and, mm -hmm. and Oh, but he, I'm sure he's always been charming. Yes, I'm sure that's yes. been part of, part of being an attractive male, white, tall human being. You know. Oh, well, I I know quite a few male, white, tall human beings who, who are, are not charming. charming. <laughs> not charming. I don't know. I just have I just have a feeling that Gregory's always been charming. Just from present talking. company excluded, of course. <laughs> there are two charming, <laughs> tall, Go white ahead, males I'm sorry. here. Um, but we weren't. You know, we, we had we had our place. We Maureen Stapleton was in the cast, mm -hmm. and Edward Asner, and. Mm. Very good actors. And yeah. So. It but you see, that's the difference right there. That's the difference. What? I did not feel that I was in a place. Oh, I felt very intimidated by it. See? And God, I, I felt intimidated just walking onto some sound stages and talking to some of these people as I've been out here since July. Mm -hmm. So, you know, no, not knowing anyone. I don't know if the word My is My enthusiasm for being with those people, I think, eliminated whatever uh, 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 awe. I was feeling. It overpowered the mm -hmm. awe so that I didn't feel like I should keep my place or, or like they, they should take forefront and I should sit back. And I just want, I was so enthusiastic about meeting these actors that I'd admired yeah. that I wanted to spend time with them. Well, I, I'm, I come from a position where I'm beginning to learn that I have a right to be wherever I am. So if I am on a soundstage and just sit there, just as a human being, I have a right to be there. I don't have to be intimidated or feel, you know, it's the same word. I don't like that word intimidated and don't like to use mm -hmm. it in that sense, but I don't know how else to describe it. Mm -hmm. But to say that I have a right to be wherever it is that I am and I can talk to someone else, human being to human being, whether I am uh, uh, merely a part of the periphery or I'm an active participant in a scene or whether I am a leader, whatever, I just have a right to be there at the same time claiming that right without the arrogance mm -hmm. that that would that would be the other side of the same coin mm -hmm. you know? so that's the, mm -hmm. the balance that I'm trying to learn out here because yeah. I want to go through this whatever it is that I have to do go through gently and without you know causing as little uh, as little um, disturbance to other people's lives as far as as far as me stepping on them as I'm trying to as I'm trying to live live right. out whatever I have to do. Right. So you've got to your how has it been being a tall white male attractive man who gets all the 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 ego reinforcement that uh, that anyone wants in we get it when, when we read about it and when we read in, in books, in mm -hmm. psychology books, about what all the ego reinforcement, you epitomize it. So how has it been? 
Well, thank you for that. But uh, well, I mean, it's it kind reminds, of the luck know, of the draw, right? I mean, yeah, that just right. happened. It's not something I can really yeah. lay credit for. But it was it. It has to do with something that Stephanie was talking about earlier. There is a, a relativity uh, in terms of happiness. I mean, the people who live in India and sleep on mats at night love their homes and they love their mats and they're very comfortable living there. A lot of them, I'm sure, some of them are starving also. But yeah, well, I've studied I've studied Indian Hinduism and this sort of stuff. And there's some strange things. So that's you're right. You're absolutely right. And yet, someone from Los Angeles, who slept in a bed all the time and went there, would be very unhappy living yeah. that kind of a life. And probably they would be unhappy living in a house here. So uh, it's a very relative thing for me, happiness. And, and uh, uh, okay, I, I was gifted with, with uh, some, some looks, and I was gifted with some talent, and, mm -hmm. uh, and I can sing, and I haven't studied, and, and that's pretty lucky for me. I've got a lot of lucky things that happened to me. But in looking at those, whatever assets I may have, I also established my goals based on those assets. And my goals, I think, go far beyond where they would be if I hadn't been gifted with looks or, or, uh, or a voice or any talent. You know, then you, you set your goals depending your on goals what you go. think you can reach. Where do you think you can hit? Mm -hmm. And so my happiness depends on hitting those goals to a great extent. And I've set them way up there. And now I find that five years ago, if I'd have been offered a TV series or a movie, I thought, boy, I'd give my left leg to clean that up. And I'd give my left leg to, uh, mm -hmm. to, to get a movie or a series. And then I got offered a series. Then I got offered a movie. And suddenly that wasn't the end all. And that was just the first step in a goal that was much, much higher. It was, it was satisfying at that moment, but it wasn't the kind of thing you can sit back and rest on your laurels and say, well, I got offered the movie, so I'm, my career is set. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm a fulfilled man now. So How are my, you going to avoid some, do you see any pitfalls for yourself? Oh, I see How do you a see million of them. How do you see yourself for all of us. right now? Right now at 28 years old and there. How do you, how do you see Gregory Harrison? <laughs> well, uh, that's, that's, that would take hours probably, but all right. overall I, 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 I sense that you're asking me how do I see myself career-wise? No, as a human being. As a human being, I see myself very excited about life, very fulfilled for the moment, and uh, looking forward uh, with with enthusiasm to a, to a future that I that I have a feeling is going to be very fulfilling. Mm -hmm. And your present? My my present is uh, for the most part very fulfilling. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't ever. I'm never totally satisfied with anything with my life as a whole or with any particular act I make or action I do or, or any particular job I do as an actor or anything. Mm -hmm. I may be 90% satisfied occasionally and that's nice. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't... Uh, Stephanie, how about you? How do you see yourself as a human being? I think I already said that really in, in the part about the, the victim thing. I mean, mm -hmm. that's, that's something that I want to overcome probably. Um, I see myself as uh, getting more independent all the time. Um, yeah, I intuit that about you. Yeah, I'm, I'm growing. I'm getting stronger. Yeah. Do you, yeah. you see yourself also as growing, in a, in oh, a yeah. growing phase. How do we prevent ourselves? I mean, that's where I am, and that's why I meditate and do these things. How do I prevent myself from stop, stopping growing, from saying, I'm grown up? You know, how do I keep the up off of that? word and continue to grow all, don't, the, all don't the time. Close your mind. Just don't ever close your mind to anything. I hope that's it because I don't see I don't see a lot of my models. I don't see a lot of parental models and this sort of stuff that have kept growing. And I'm sure that when they were my age or when they were our ages they said the same thing. I want to keep growing and I want to do this and when do you go over that precipice when you suddenly go, well, I've had enough this time, this time I don't want to go. There are definitely plateaus in everybody's yeah. life. I mean, people don't grow like this. People grow Why? like Why not? this and like, that's just the process <laughs> of it. Um, yeah. It's like, you know, when you go like this, then it's a springboard and you go like that, you know, and then you plateau for a while. I, it, grow, growing is never, ever like that. It's almost everybody. I've yeah. You can't, I mean, there are too many things that can happen that you have nothing to do with the death mm -hmm. of someone close to you that have affects you. Have you been you. through death? 
No. Have you no. been through deaths of people around you? Yes. Gregory, you have? How have you dealt with that? Um, well, it depends on, on in the individual death or mm -hmm. tragedy involved. I hate, I, I absolutely detest uh, futility, you know. And if a death is, is futile, mm -hmm. in other words, concerning the war, and I was very much a conscientious objector in the war. Were uh, you active in the, in the war movement at all? Uh, not so much from outside. I was in the army, and mm -hmm. I ended up getting out as a conscientious objector. It was a, my own battle from within. Now, that's but, an interesting place to come from. And, okay, go on. Yeah, but uh, uh, if it's a futile death, it, it, it tears me apart, just tears me apart. But if it's a death, my great-grandmother, whom I love dearly, closest mm -hmm. person in my family to me, died about six months ago while I was shooting Centennial. And uh, she was 94, and she was my guru yeah. all my life. How exciting. And, and I was primarily concerned with myself, as most people are when somebody close to them dies. You feel badly for yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're dead. What are they going to feel? You know, really? Did you talk to her about her impending death, or did, she, did you talk to her oh, yeah, about death talked. and how she... Last time I saw her, God, before exciting. she died, I taped the whole thing. Now I can, yeah. I can check back. It wasn't a heavy thing. It was a, she was telling yeah. all of her favorite old stories. Still, yeah. yeah. And it, uh, it was great. So, so that didn't, but that didn't bother me that much. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, was, I didn't walk around destroyed because she had died. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I felt kind of good for her. I know she was old and in pain, and she's probably a lot happier. Well, see, in the, in the, in the writing that I'm doing now and in, in, in the work, uh, it concerns something about death because I have a screenplay about some uh, older people that, uh, that have to deal with death and, and some other things and was able to live uh, with my great uncle down on the ranch we were talking about earlier and talk to him about his own coming death. He was in his 80s and, and how he was dealing with it and how he was dealing with his feelings uh, uh, about what happens and going through the process. And I realized I'm going to die someday. As much as I would like to, to talk about it some other way, it's mm -hmm. going to happen. So I thought about it for myself and, and so it's, uh, but it's not something that we that we kind of deal with all the time. Listen to Jackson Brown. He just loves to sing about death. Interesting, interesting point of view on death. Mm -hmm. I just discovered that one day listening to him. I went, geez, this guy is interested in death. Mm -hmm. All this time I've loved his music. That's the whole thing it's about death me. Does music do anything for you? Or are either y'all too interested in? Oh, yeah. Do you feel music? Music, when I just introduced to Phoebe Snow. I love Phoebe Snow. I think she's great. That lady does something to the inside of me. I don't know what it is. It's magic. I mean, it just... You know, I've only been introduced to her phonographically, but isn't that marvelous yeah. that, that I could be introduced to this talent by merely going out and putting down my 549 and pulling out a vinyl disc, putting it on a, uh, on a very inexpensive uh, record player. Uh, not a, a record player. And here I'm introduced to Phoebe Snow and that magic translates. And, and I'm feeling that the magic that comes when someone sings, there's a vibrationalness to it. Maybe we've been doing it since the beginning of man, but something happens inside of me. Is it what people do something to you? Yeah, I, you know, so, so many times it doesn't have to do with the production of the tone. I mean, it doesn't have to do with the fact. Hopefully, if, if a singer is excellent, you're not thinking, Boy, they have a they have a good, nice, strong high C. <laughs> <laughs> it's just great. You're, it's something in the in the way they sing it. Piaf is mm -hmm. a perfect example. She didn't have a great voice, but it's the I don't the, know what who came, that is. Edith Piaf. She's a French singer, and she she had been a, it's she, operatic, a prostitute. Mm -hmm. huh? She's operatic. No kind of singer. No, she was a cabaret singer. Cabaret mm -hmm. singer. And she was a, 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 she drank and she w had been a prostitute and and her whole pain and, and joy and all the emotion she felt came out in her singing mm -hmm. and it doesn't really have to do with the sound it has to do with I mean look at Fred Astaire he's a wonderful singer and he he's not in the books of legitimate singing he's mm -hmm. not a, a great singer but there's something about it. there is do you have people that do something to you? You were talking about Jackson Brown. Oh, yeah. But I, I don't know. I, I like all the different uh, identities you know, that, that, ex that are exposed when people sing. Each person exposes a real unique identity to me just when they start to sing. Stephanie does in the show. 
that we're doing, you know. Uh, we won't talk about the reviews. <laughs> the reviews. How have y'all dealt with the reviews? I've read mixed reviews. I've read some yeah. some reviews that that had some real neat things to say about them, and I've read some other reviews. How have y'all dealt with the reviews coming in a musical? Funny. It's been real weird. It's Tell been me. very strange. Because uh, half it's half and half, or mm -hmm. pretty close to it. You know, it's either hate mail or or love letters mm -hmm. uh, from these it's critics. Not mediocre at all. And and. We'll talk about he's for the it. most uh, part yeah, had yeah. had good yeah. notices almost all around. We've had we had seventy eight critics there yeah. opening night from all, you know, the biggest to the smallest publications mm -hmm. and and news things and um, <clears throat> about the the big five was ha sort of split half and half. I mean, the, as I consider the one, the the Variety, Hollywood Reporter, L.A. Times, Examiner, I guess Valley News isn't one of the big five. Well, you live in the valley, <laughs> so you want to include. But. Uh, it was sort of split right down for for the for the L.A. Times review. There was the uh, Herald Examiner review. Mm -hmm. For the Variety review, there was the Hollywood. But how have you dealt with that? You know, it's just well. Yesterday, yeah. I I got one great review, one really great review. The rest were it really was bad. A proposal, don't you? Yeah. Well, the rest were really terrible. The uh, the th three that I had seen. So somebody said, I don't. I'll just go. Somebody said that uh, <laughs> that I had four good reviews out of the seventy-eight. So I hadn't only seen one. So I decided to go to the scrapbook <laughs> 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 yesterday before the performance and find the other three. But on my way to find the other three, <laughs> you found twenty. <laughs> She cannot sing. She has a thin voice. She uh, is a pale television personality. She, on and on. And mm -hmm. by the end of it, I'm just like this. And the director was there. Well, good. <laughs> oh, I, I had dealt with the other three fine. You know, I. The the day after, our opening night was the best performance I ever gave, and that was after seeing the review of. Or I think it was. Yeah. Tell them the story about what happened to you on stage opening night. <laughs> Oh, well, no, it's not. Because it's a great acting story. It happens to all of us. Well, it's, I'm say. lucky that it happened then anyway. But um, in the middle of my first scene, my, my acting scene on stage in the first part of the show on opening night with the 78 critics out there, <laughs> it suddenly occurred to me how to play the part. I mean, ah. the attack to take. <laughs> Yeah. Because given the structure of the play and the limitations of the two mm -hmm. protagonists, it suddenly occurred to me what line I had to follow. So I, I attempted it somewhat that night, and then the next night was really... Next night was right on. Was good. And, when, but, you, uh, when you hit that place where it's right on, you feel it deep within inside you. Is that must yeah, be an well, incredible... I, I haven't experienced that yet. I will. Well, what it does is it's a kind of freedom, which is also a tremendous concentration. When you have an attack on something, I remember my pop used to say this, and I never really understood it. He always said... Your father in the business? Yes. Uh -huh. He used to say, uh, d whatever you do, always have an attack. It doesn't matter whether it's right or wrong or big or little, mm -hmm. but always have a certain angle that you approach. And when you do have an angle, it adds energy to you. It gives you focus without being a conscient, you know, conscious kind of focus and it's marvelous and it makes it much it gives you much freedom in it to, within that God I'm excited about learning that taking some classes under uh, one of Joan Darling's assistants so yeah. I'm getting what, what in, is her name uh, uh, Judy Kerr Judy Kerr and uh, Samantha is her Judy. other Samantha yeah, yeah. Uh, the other one and that's Bill Macy's wife I, I don't know yeah. I don't know but I know that the spirituality that I'm coming from there and what there's what they're saying are the same things. I mean, uh, that I'm feeling in my meditation. I'm feeling this. So I'm feeling that we're on the right track. So I'm going to be learning the things that you guys mm -hmm. have been privileged enough mm -hmm. to experience in performing. When you feel that, did you feel some of the same things that Stephanie? Feels when I when feel you, like when, it's when working. You, yeah, when you get right into it. Oh yeah. Well, especially in this part, because <laughs> I deal directly with the audience, and and I. Uh, if, it's a troubadour, if, isn't it? It's a troubadour character, and he's like I'm El great. Gallo in the Fantastics, or whatever. He's constantly dealing with the audience, and then he, he dons some little character that he plays in a scene, and then turns back to the audience and play. And if it's working, I have never felt anything that even approaches it. You know, it's Hearing like having the audience in your hands and just mold them into whatever mm -hmm. emotion you want them to feel, and they're, and being a very very benevolent dictator, sort of, is, is when it's working, how it feels. 
You know, it's like, yes, I have you all in my power.